Today's reading can be taken from the book of Ephesians, and we're starting at chapter 2. It can be found on page 1174 of your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. If you'd keep your blue Bibles open, if you've got one nearby, on page 1174, and we're going to uh, spend some time looking at that passage together. Let's begin by praying and asking for God's help. Father God, thank you that in your word you reveal yourself to us. Thank you that you speak and you show us what you're like and what you've done for us. And we praise you very much for this part of your word in Ephesians 2. And we praise you for the wonderful things it tells us about you and your character. And we pray that whether we're hearing these ideas for the first time or the millionth time this morning, please would you um, give us minds and hearts that are open to hear your word, and please would you show us yourself so that each of us would go home this morning knowing you better and loving you more. Amen. I wonder if you think God is likable. I'm not asking if you're a Christian or not. We love having people with us on Sunday mornings who aren't Christians. But we all have an idea of God in our head. Whether you believe in that God or not, do you like him? Do you warm to his personality? One of the central promises God makes to Christians about the future is that when he remakes this creation and gives us eternal life in his perfect place the pinnacle the absolutely best thing about that will be that we get to be with God look at Ephesians 2 verse 7 it's talking there about the coming ages and it says that it's going to be all about experiencing God's grace and his kindness so God's character really matters doesn't it if he isn't actually that loving then the universe would be a better place if we replaced him with someone who is. If God isn't nice, then Christianity isn't good news because Christianity is all about getting to enjoy relationship with God. Obviously, we can find plenty of atheist writers who argue that the God of the Bible is not at all nice. Richard Dawkins famously calls God the great surveillance camera in the sky. He is an unjust, unforgiving control freak and a capriciously malevolent bully. But it's not just the atheists who don't like the God of the Bible. Martin Luther was a German monk 500 years ago, and as a monk, he knew his guilt. 
life in a monastery was not easy. The day started at 2 a.m. with prayers, and there were prayers again at 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. and 12 noon and so on. Sometimes Luther went three days without food or water in a religious fast. Monks dedicated themselves to climbing the steep ladder to heaven. But Luther was very, very aware that he did not match up to God's standards. This is a quote from Martin Luther. My situation was that, although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner, troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my, no confidence that my merit would assuage him. He who is said to be of such mercy and goodness appears cruel and intolerable. I was more than once driven to the very abyss of despair so that I wished I'd never been created. Love God? I hated him. And yet this miserable despairing monk kick-started what is known as the Reformation when real Christianity was rediscovered. And the Reformation was a movement of joy and delight and freedom. The kind of joy in God that makes you hungry to hear him speak to you in his word, the Bible, and makes praising God in song or however one of life's greatest pleasures. A joy in God that makes speaking to him in prayer very precious and makes obeying him our constant aim. Do you have that kind of joy in God? Luther's hatred of God was transformed into a much greater love that he said was inexpressibly sweet. And it's the truths of Ephesians 2 that transformed him. Ephesians 2 tells us that we are saved by grace alone. Verse 8, look at it with me. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Salvation is an utterly free gift of God. We have nothing to contribute. That is what made Luther love God. But it's very hard for us to believe that God is like Ephesians 2 says he is. It's not just famous atheists and monks from 500 years ago who have a different impression of God. Even as Christians, we can easily slip into having a false idea of God. So we're going to look at Luther's false God and then at his real God. That's how we're going to do this morning. Look at his false God and then his real God. And we'll see why he went from cold duty and even hatred to be able to say things like this from Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. That's strong language, isn't it? But if we grasp the truth of Ephesians 2, then we cannot help feeling like that about God. So first, the God Luther hated. Luther, I think, had understood up to verse 3 in Ephesians 2 and no further. Let me read from verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, deserving wrath. Luther knew the cravings of his sinful nature. God's law is to love God and love neighbor perfectly. It's a great law, but it leaves us, as verse 1 says, dead in our transgressions and sins. Because naturally, in our sinful nature, we are self-interested. Loving God and loving the people around us is hard. It takes conscious effort, doesn't it? But loving myself, well, I've been able to do that without thinking since I was born. Luther knew his love was so often turned in on himself. Sometimes he confessed his sins to a priest for six hours at a time. Six hours at a time confessing his sin to a priest. And afterwards he would analyze that repentance and question his motivation. Was he truly repentant or did he just want to avoid punishment for the things that he'd done? Luther realized that even his confession to God was selfish and imperfect. In other words, Luther was a normal human being. We're not perfect like God. If we know ourselves and we're really honest about it, then each of us knows that we've never had a moment entirely free from self 
interests. So how do you relate to a God of pure goodness and love when you know that naturally you deserve to be an object of his anger? And Luther, the young man, had only one answer. It's why he couldn't love God. Luther thought we had to relate to God, the negotiator. That's the false God that Luther had in his mind. Negotiators are big news at the moment, aren't they? What with Brexit and the, uh, the EU and British negotiators have both explained in the past weeks something that's at the heart of the negotiator relationship. They've said this, you don't get something for nothing. That's how Luther thought we had to relate to God. You don't get something for nothing. So we offer to do something for God and God, in turn, agrees to do something for us. Or God demands something of us, and if we do what he demands, then he gives. Luther lived trying to offer God a deal. People try lots of different kinds of negotiation with God. There's religious negotiation. In Luther's day, that meant going on pilgrimage to see relics, or going to confession, or doing masses, or even becoming a monk. Basically, do something religious to earn God's love. So our modern version, I suppose, is someone who says, I pray, I go to church, I believe what God says I have to believe, therefore God must love me. That's religious negotiation. You may be familiar as well with moral negotiation. Moral negotiation basically says, God demands that I be good, so I'll be a good person and God will love me. Or if people actually know how high God's standards are, then we make it a bit more realistic by saying, if I at least do my best, then God will do the rest. If what I'll do for God is I'll, I'll do my best. We think we can do something for God's love. We think something about us might make God love us. But there are two big problems with God the negotiator. The first is that we don't love negotiators, do we? It's a business relationship. We're trying to get something from them, like we try and get something from a vending machine, perhaps. With a vending machine, we put our money in and you get the chocolate out or the crisps or whatever it is you like. We might love the chocolate, but you don't love a vending machine. If God is simply a negotiator making demands for us to meet, then we'll only ever love his gifts and not him. In fact, we'll resent him. We won't love his commands. We won't love obeying him. The Christian life will feel like a burden, like it did for Luther. He felt God's commands were cruel and intolerable. If you feel burdened by the Christian life, if the Christian life for you is more a duty than an act of love, then perhaps you're in part trying to relate to God as a negotiator, trying to do a deal, trying to get what you want from God by doing something for him. And Ephesians 2 nails the biggest problem with that for us because if God is a negotiator, then he's a negotiator with impossible demands, isn't he? Because the real God needs nothing that I have and he asks for more than I could ever give. Do you remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? Not just don't murder, but don't even have any hate in your heart. Not just don't commit adultery, but anyone who even looks at another person with lust in their heart is an adulterer. Not just love people who you like, but love your enemies. Be perfect, Jesus said, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Do you want to do a deal with God on those terms? You see, if we're serious about trying to relate to God as negotiator, then we'll realize, like Luther did, that we're not people who just need to buck up our ideas a bit. We're verse 1 people, aren't we? Not just a little bit sick, but dead in our transgressions and sins. We're spiritually dead. We might still have a heartbeat now but God's death sentence is hanging over us. And that is why verse 4 to 10 is such good news, because it's a totally different picture than God the negotiator. Ephesians 2 is about the God whom Luther came to love. So verse 1 to 3 make it clear that sin is what left us dead. It was how we were living that meant God was angry with us. So you might expect that the solution is for people to live a different way. So maybe it would go like this. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, but then you turned back to God. You started living his way. You started doing your best. That is pretty much the heart of every other world religion, but not Christianity. Ephesians 2 doesn't go like that at all. It's not you were dead, 
and then you did something. And how could it be? Because dead people can't help themselves. But verse 4, do you see the actual shape of Ephesians 2? You were dead, verse 1 to 3, and then verse 4, God made us alive with Christ. So, verses 8 to 10, it's by grace you have been saved. The gracious God of the Bible doesn't negotiate. He gives. We'll see next Sunday how Jesus Christ is the everything of what Jesus gives, of what God gives. God's grace comes through Christ alone, who died for us on the cross. But the focus of Ephesians 2 is that it's all from God and nothing from us. He made alive, verse 5. Verse 6, he raised up and seated us. And look at verse 8. It is an awesome verse. By verse 8, Paul has already written enough to make it obvious that salvation came from God. So why does he emphasize it so strongly, do you think? He says, by grace you've been saved, not from yourselves, the gift of God, and then verse 9, not by works. Paul is desperate for us to know more than just that salvation came from God. You can think salvation came from God like a piece of furniture comes from Ikea. So I got this bookcase from Ikea, it cost me 55 pounds. I got this salvation from God. It cost me my Sunday mornings and some money given to charity and a life generally with an effort to live well. That's the salvation from God the negotiator. That is me contributing something to my salvation. But Ephesians 2 is about God the giver. And it is a one-way gift. Nothing comes from ourselves. No works involved. And so, verse 9, there's nothing we can boast about. What is it that makes the difference between a Christian and someone who's not a Christian? If we think it's something about us, then we're wrong. The difference is God's grace. The boasting thing in verse 9 is really helpful. If there's anything I could point to in myself as a reason that I'm saved, then I'd have something to boast about, wouldn't I? If I have contributed even 0.01% to my salvation, then I could boast about that 0.01%. But no one can boast because it's by grace alone. God's grace is like a vacuum. A vacuum is a space entirely devoid of matter. No particles, no molecules, just empty space. If you put just one atom into a vacuum, then it's not a vacuum anymore because there's an atom in it. (laughs) In a similar way, if we contribute anything to our salvation, just one atom, then it is not grace anymore. God's grace is a space entirely devoid of our efforts. No works, no contribution, just free grace. It's not 99.99% God and 0.01% me. It's 100% God. The church in Luther's day all agreed about the language that they needed God's grace, but they also thought they had to contribute something too. We do our best, God does the rest. But God doesn't do the rest. God does it all. It's not grace unless it's grace alone. And that is why faith is the only way to receive God's grace. It's right there in the middle of verse 8 and 9. We're saved by grace, not works. And it's through faith. So God gives us his grace gift through faith, which is itself part of God's gift to us. So faith isn't something that we can contribute and boast about it's not something we offer to God in a sense we're doing something aren't we because we're actively putting our trust in God but faith isn't something we give to God that would make it a work faith is the opposite in fact of giving something to God faith is having empty hands for God to fill that's faith I have nothing please give me your gift of salvation a negotiator hates the empty hands of faith, don't they? They demand that you give them things. That's what a negotiator does. So relate to God as a negotiator, and we'll spend our lives trying to offer things to God. We'll work, and we'll work, and we'll work. Dutiful religion, burdened obedience, joyless service. And if we try to fill our hands for God, then we'll end up resenting him when we realize that we can't give him enough to meet his perfect standards. 
But God loves empty hands. He loves to fill them himself. Look at verses 4 to 5. And have your heart warmed at God's character. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And look at why he did it in verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. To understand God's free gift to us in Jesus is to glimpse his rich mercy and his great love and his incomparable grace and kindness. That is what transformed Luther. He described it like this. He said, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Then I grasped that the righteousness of God is that righteousness which through sheer grace and mercy, God makes us righteous through faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. If you have true faith that God is your savior, then at once you have a gracious God. Faith leads you in and opens up God's heart and will that you should see pure grace and overflowing love. To behold God in faith is to look upon his fatherly, friendly heart in which there is no anger or ungraciousness. In other words, God gives us something for nothing. He's kind and generous. He doesn't ask people to make themselves attractive before he loves them. He loves us first. And so being in relationship with this God is a joy. We're going to think about three aspects of Christian joy as we finish. Christian joy, first of all, is a joyful humility. Sometimes we live, I think, the Christian life as if God is keeping score and giving us grades about how we're doing. And so people who think they're decent Christians, they feel pretty good about themselves, and others despair that they are weak failures. But wonderfully, both of those reactions miss the point, don't they? Because God isn't grading us. If he did, then the best of us would fail. He's already, though, given us Jesus and given us Jesus' grade as our own. It's our pride, isn't it, that makes us keep thinking it's about how we're doing. Pride says God is up there and I need to ascend to God by my own strength. So if I feel strong, I'll boast, and if I feel weak, I'll despair. But both of those reactions are pride because we're thinking that it's our strength that matters. But at the cross of Jesus, God came down here because we have no strength of our own. God's grace destroys pride and it removes despair. And instead, you get joyful humility, empty hands receiving grace. And that means we don't have to put on masks with one another. It's a little bit, I think, how uh, people vacuum and tidy before they're having people around their house. Um, we want to, people to see our house at its best, don't we? And I think we're pretty good sometimes at doing the same with our own lives. We present the best possible picture of ourselves. We hide away our sin and we pretend that we're sorted. So the family row stops the moment we reach the church car park because church is somewhere we have to pretend to be perfect. But grace gets rid of all of that rubbish. We don't have to pretend we're perfect. Grace gives us joyful humility instead. We were dead. God made us alive. And as well as joyful humility, we get joyful freedom. You can spend the same amount of money either paying a gas bill or buying a present for someone you love. And though it's the same amount of money, the two things feel very different, don't they? It's our duty to pay a gas bill. It's not a thing of joy. It's an obligation. But when we give a present to a loved one, there's a freedom about the way that we spend that money. We spent it because we wanted to. We did it with joy. Sometimes we live for God as if we're paying a gas bill. We'd rather not, but we have to. And as if God is demanding works from us. But Christianity doesn't work like that. It's not grace plus works. It's just grace. 
And it's not grace and then works either. Lots of Christians make the grace and then works mistake. We're saved by grace. We get into the room by grace, if you like. But we'd better stay in the room by works. I'll be kicked out if my works aren't up to scratch. As if the good works mentioned in verse 10 are the small print that actually undoes everything that was written in verses 1 to 9. But they don't. God saves us by grace and he always relates to us by grace. Good works are just the way a Christian lives because God has saved us. They come out of us because God has saved us. The more we know his love, the more we love others and the more we love him. Christians don't do good because we're obliged to. We have a joyful freedom. We do good because you can't help wanting to do good when you know God's love. Joyful humility, joyful freedom, and finally joyful love. We started by asking if God is likable. If we treat him like a great big vending machine in the sky, then we won't love him. If we try to negotiate ourselves a deal with the perfect God, then we'll end up resenting him. We'd wish we were free of him, free of his demands. But the real God, Luther discovered as he read his Bible, is the one that you never want to be free from. There's one uncomplicated way for you and I to have the same joy that Luther did so that we can feel like we've entered paradise through open gates. Simply look at the true God, the ultimate giver. We get to enter paradise with empty hands of faith because God, who is rich in mercy, gave. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, laid down his life for us. There is no greater love in the universe than that. And that's the love that made Paul pray what he did just a little bit later in Ephesians. And it seems a good place for us to end this morning. Chapter 3, partway through verse 17. Paul wrote this. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all Christians, all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Our Father God, we pray for ourselves that we would know how wide and long and high and deep is your love for us in Christ. We thank you so much that you're a God of grace. We praise you so much that we don't have to contribute anything. Indeed, we can't contribute anything. Thank you that you save by grace alone. Would you give us that joyful humility, knowing that empty hands of faith are filled by you? Would you give us that freedom that doesn't hear your word and your commands as burdensome demands, but that loves to have been saved by you and that loves to live your way. And please would you grow our love for you more and more. We thank you so much for that great hope we have of the coming ages where we'll get to enjoy your kindness to us in Jesus for eternity. Thank you so much for saving us. Amen.